Instead of me fulfilling my prophecy, I have to start one. Instead of me carrying on the empire, I have to build one. I was raised to understand that you cannot know where you're going if you don't know where we've been. There are many firsts, and many stories that will be told for generations. The first Negro in history to win a major tennis title. Thurgood Marshall, the first of his race. So the first African-American woman to medal in the... It is a long journey to this moment. America, we have come so far, but there's so much more to do. This is the first time that I get a chance to actually speak upon you with the, with the utmost respect that you deserve in our culture of hip hop. To me, you are one of the four founders of our culture if it was a Mount Morris or what they call it, Mount Rich Marsh or whatever the fuck they want to call it, you're supposed to stand there with your gangster hat on. Prickola, you died on me too soon, and you know you should have stuck around to be talking about your own legacy. But you know what? As long as I'm here and you got a voice in me, I'm going to project that voice and let people know that you definitely was a bot and a pillar in this whole genre that we call music of the DJs. As a child, the Bronx was the world. It was an amazing place to grow up. You know, being from the Bronx and, 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 and knowing that the Bronx got so much history, Bronx is so magical and there's a lot of people that went on to become, you know, movie stars and television, and great musicians. We just came from a really, really rough background. We started beatboxing because we couldn't afford drums. We were poor. Not poor, poor. We couldn't even afford the other OR. We was just poor. That poverty creates pressure. Pressure either bust pipes or make diamonds. When Mario came, was in the era of like high school. They stayed to themselves and everything, but we got to know them. As a way to escape the labor-intensive life of working in the cotton and tobacco fields, the young Glenn Mario Halsey left Edenton, North Carolina and moved with his aunt, who was a resident of the Bronxdale housing projects in the Bronx. Mario would have to learn quickly that New York was going to be a very different place. As time grew on, he kind of adapted that New York City spunk to him. By 1969, Mario was not only accepted by Bronxdale, but also looked to for his leadership. With a love for music and seeing people happy, he found a way to mesh the two, giving way to what would eventually become known as the Block Party. If you brought any kind of music around, that's where people were going to gather. At that time, he had like some house speakers and, and a, a, a record player. And then he started getting a little bit more equipment. You know, he just, he just started his own trend. He played whatever he wanted to play, and people danced to it. What he was playing a disco record. What he was playing music that our moms and pops play in the house. He played music all around the board. As Mario's popularity grew, so did his jams. And by 1971, he'd firmly established himself as a prominent DJ in the Bronx. With disco music still in its infancy, Mario took on the name Disco King Mario and spread in tandem with the same explosiveness as disco music itself. 
He fed the crowd. He gave us food and he filled our souls. Mario was also known for being a ladies' man because he was very handsome and he loved to dance to the music that he played. And his signature move was the snake. He used to be dancing, he'd break out into the snake and all the girls would go crazy. He would shake and do his body like this. <laughs> he would do it like this. He was snaking. He would put his hand back on his head like this with his hat. He would shake like this. Every place he'd go, he would snake. And he'd get a girl out there and he'd have two girls and he'd put his hand on the back of his head, cigarette hanging out of his mouth and he'd start shaking like that. Yeah, everywhere he'd go, he would do that. Everywhere. And I remember one time, remember they used to wear those little shorts with the stripes. And I hate to say it, I ain't had no business looking, but he had no drawers on. <laughs> and he was just shaking. <laughs> and them girls was going crazy over him. During a time when home turf and area became protected commodities, Mario became an original member of the legendary street gang, the Black Spades. Well, the Bronxdale projects, to me, it reminded me of Cabrini Green in Chicago. You know what I'm saying? Everybody was broke. You know, it was gangs running all over the place. And that's the way the Bronx was, man. It was so many gangs here. There were gangs all over the place. Our projects, Bronxdale, was basically on the borderline of a lot of uh, Caucasian racist groups. Well, there's an Italian neighborhood really less than a mile from our projects to the north. They would drive into our community uh, with baseball bats and chains and switchblades and they would beat us up or they would rob us. Like imagine like 20 white guys walking around looking like Fonzie. So the Black Spades formed as a way to protect our community. You could maybe, you know, have to go to a, a store that was in Westchester Square. And once you get there, they're going to chase you. They're going to chase you with bats and beat you. So if you ran and you got to White Plains Road, you were safe. You know, the spades had that, like, you couldn't cross that. What I respect about the black spades, those gangs didn't harass old people. They protected them. They didn't beat up on regular people. They only fought other gangs. They was protecting the hood. But you had to be hard and you had to be connected in the community to even be able to bring equipment out in those days because those were the days of stick up kids. You bring your equipment out and you ain't have the crew or the juice to be in that community. When you finish jamming and you packing your stuff in your van, they'll pull up a van right next to yours and tell you to put your stuff in their van. Take the keys, let you pack your van and take your van. <laughs> came at Mario Long, somebody would check you before before you even got to Mario. Mario wasn't one of those cats you just wanted to approach and just walk up on, because he would hurt you. You might got folded up into a little package and tossed. Hey, if you hear a rumor, you come and see yourself. If we were looking for you, man, I guarantee you, we would have came to your turf. If you have beef and you get Mario, he can whistle and, you know, guys will start flying out of nowhere. He had his own gang. Having the Chuck Chuck City crew and the Black Spades have his back gave Mario the ultimate hood pass. Fellow Spade and good friend Sinbad shared a musical connection with Mario. But it was Sinbad's introduction to another friend that would start weaving a fabric that would eventually grow to cover the entire world. We became partners with Bam, but I was living in the same building with Mario. Bam bought his Zulus, they really didn't care for me because I was from Bronxdale. 
but Mario wanted to do something with Bam because Bam had the records and Bam had like a little following. How about if I get this school? You think you can get Bam to play in it? I said, I try to talk to Bam and see what happens. And Bam, he said, but I tried to get it. They said, no. I said, but Mario said he can get it. Mario would get it and, um, and that would be it. They would play. The guy had a talent, a talent to get places that nobody can get. Mario had connection. He knew how to butter up the people that was in charge. All of the people in the schools, we got to know all of the janitors in the school, and Mario tightened up everybody. He said, hey, I tighten them up, Cindy. I tighten them up so we can get to school again because I, I greased their palms. He said, I gave them a little extra, Cindy. I gave them a little extra $50. He said, they said, anytime you want it, Mario, anytime you want to school, just, you just come. I'll give it to you, nobody else. The Audubon Ballroom, Mario thought of it. That was the last big thing they played in. We couldn't get the place. They didn't want to rent the place. Mario said, let me go in it. This isn't my normal crowd. I think, baby, I'm gonna come in here with the worm. You know Every place he'd go, he would snake. He would say, Cindy. Love it. It's gonna be so big. All right. Love it. Next thing you know, Mario said, we got it. Bam got really popular because a lot of places Bam played that he wouldn't be able to play if it wasn't for Mario. Mario had risen to the top. He was loved, feared, and greatly respected. He attained a power that few would ever know. It would seem that he had everything. That, however, was only a perception. He didn't have, you know, the education like that, but you would never know it. He came from down south and he didn't go to school. I know he knew how to add money up, but he said he, he didn't know how to really read and write. But it didn't stop him for his other talents, like a blind man being able to do other things. Well, Mario was just like a blind person. He was able to use his other talents to get places, to bring people together. All of y'all that can't read, y'all just hang out. Mm -hmm. All right, now once they started hanging out together, then they get tight. Then at once they let's play hooky, man, we ain't learning that no way. So let's cut out. And that, that's when you get to the point that kids drop out of school. What they do, they jump in the crime. Because that's the only thing that's giving them money. They can't jump out of school into a job. And he may not be able to read and write. And I guess there's a lot of people out there rich that didn't really, that really is not that intelligent, but he used his other talents. I'm up in my 20s. I can't even read. I can't get a good job. What it feel like? Feel like, man, what can I say? I can't do that. I can't function. He had a beautiful heart. He was a hustler. He had a soft side. He had a slick side. He was a player, you know, he had girls that was chasing him. He liked to wear big hats, you know what I mean? He was, a, he was like super fly, shag. You know, he was like a black exploitation movie walking down the street that lives in your building. He like, you see Mario coming, all you hear is like Mario, it looked like he should have his own theme music. Cause he, he liked the way he walked, his whole style. He was just always smashing. He could sell water to a fish. He was one of a kind. He was the kind of person, man, he always got what he wanted. If he wanted to get a venue, he got the venue. If he wanted to get some extra equipment, he got the extra equipment. If he, he always set out to do something, he always got it done. Sometimes I wanted to come outside on my mini bike I couldn't come outside, but if, if Mario went upstairs and told my mother, hey, you know, Miss D, can Booby come out with his mini bike or whatever, she would say yes because she know Mario ain't gonna let nothing happen to me. We used to see the van, and when we saw the van, we knew Mario would play. And he used to tell, you know, the mothers, you know, let us out. Oh, they'll be all right. Let them come out here and play with the other kids. It's gonna be fun. I'm gonna be playing and he would have his equipment out there and he would play, but he would watch us. 
In July of 1973, Mario's influence and contributions would be solidified when he brought together rival communities under the banner of music. His 21 Days of Summer spawned a culture that would take on a life of its own. The whole summer, we was at these block parties. Mario played in Orchie Beach. He played in Rosedale Park. It was like every day. <laughs> it wasn't just Friday and Saturday. It was like every day. And it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Mario would bring his music out in a dime. He would bring his out. Sydney, it's nice out. Let's bring the music out. We bring it out Bronx Steel. We bring it out Soundview. We bring it out Monroe. We bring it out here. We bring the music out wherever we can get a permit. He played the entire month. He played. We broke day. Everybody's saying the first documented party in hip hop was Herc's party in 1973. Now, documented means written down. Okay, so that does not mean that it was the first party because nobody made a flyer and said, you know, that this is a party. But by that time, Mario had already started. Her, you came along on it, but you know, you came along on it. I can still see you to this day standing in the background looking at Bam and Mario. You didn't start hip hop, nobody started hip hop. Rosedale Park, right here. We were playing there, and it was so packed. I mean, old people, young people, kids. Rosedale Park, at that time, it was, it was clear. Mario, when he did things, he did it big. It was, he had to go all out. Before anybody had a real sound system, he was already out there with a sound system. He already knew when I came out in the park, I wanted to be louder, I wanted to be bigger, I wanted to be better than everybody. You knew when you went to go to a park jam with Mario, you was gonna hear them speakers two projects down. This was before anything was on records. There was no records, there was no rap records, there was no rap groups. There was just dudes coming out, setting up their music, rocking the world. I couldn't explain to you how 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 beautiful the equipment sounded, man. Ooh. Them eliminators and them Marlboros he had, ooh, they sounded so beautiful. It's like, wow, do you hear that? It wasn't like today. The energy would draw people from the surrounding areas, and then not only surrounding areas, it would be so infectious. Later on, it would spread through the boroughs. He definitely is one of the fathers of, of, of hip hop man because he was doing it for a long time before we started calling it hip hop. He was doing it when we was calling it the jam. He definitely helped make hip hop what it is today. You ever heard of like love at first sight? That's what it was for me and Mario. It was like love at first sight because he heard my voice and he said, Wow, your voice sounds so vicious. And he had, he had a funny way of saying words. And vicious was so vicious to him. This sounds vicious. This is, this sounds vicious. It was vicious. It wasn't so vicious. Vicious. So vicious. And we became friends after that. And he said, yo, you stick with me. And you rock my microphone. I buy all that same shit Hurt got. We are sound so vicious. My brother Mean Gene took me to that side of town. And um, that's when I seen Mario and, and, and I seen uh, that Busy B was, 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 uh, was MCing for him. And when I went over there, um, he was like, yo, you know, yeah, I want to get you to come over here and, and DJ for me, you know? And I was like, yeah, sure. Sundance is running up on Mario. He's the bold one. Mario, you need to bring my DJ here. My boy John. 
Yeah, we heard about him, whatever, but you know, is he good enough to be with the Chuck Chuck City crew? For real? Nobody in Chuck City could even mess with me at that point. We're gonna transition and we're gonna go to Chuck Chuck City crew, which was forbidden territory. Mario was from Bronxdale. Bronx River did not get along with Bronxdale. Couldn't cross those boundaries. My career was at stake. You know what? I was gonna risk it and take the chance. Getting with Mario, it was well worth the chance. It must have been about 1971. I was going to the store for my aunt and I heard music coming out of the laundry room. So uh, the door wasn't fully closed. So I pushed it open just a little bit enough that I could see inside, and there he was, Disco King Mario, with two turntables and a mixer with a knob on it. I was frozen, I couldn't move. I stood there in the door for a long time. Finally, Mario said, hey man, why don't you come in and close the door? And I was like, for real? He was like, yeah, come on in. So I went in, spent hours just listening to Mario DJ. Mario's the one that gave me the chance. The play on Mario's system was the deal. That means you've arrived. I walk in and out of Bronxdale like a king now, because I'm down with Disco King Mario. One day, Bambada, who didn't have a sound system like Mario, but Bambada was the master of records, putting records together. We're doing a party in Rosedale Park. Mario's like, yeah, Bambada, you can play on my set. Van Bader starts passing me from his personal collection of records, tidbits. Van Bader seeing that, hey, wait a minute. This cat got some talent. We strike up a conversation. We live a half a minute away from each other and never talk until that day. On Mario's set, Mario's the one responsible for putting me and Van Bader together. They had some records or something. Yo, who is it? Mario had the records. Jay went, came back to get the records. Hey, hey, hey. Great show out there tonight. Hey, thank you, brother. Thank you thank really rocked out. Sister, I got big plans, man. Me and you. I told Mario and Jay to the top, man. That's what we're going to do. I got his match now, this. Me and you, this is it. Hi. You showed me a lot of love. You put me on the show. But, um,. Mario just wasn't having it at the time. I'm off the Bronx River and talking to Bam, and I think I'm going to roll with him. You know, it gets to the point where, you know, um, Mario might have said, well, I mean, if you my DJ, you my DJ. Who put you in a position to win, Jay? Mario gets in a jealous rage. Now he tells me, you at Chuck Chuck City. Chuck Chuck City has no more need for you, but all your records that you brought here to Chuck City. you right here. Staying with Chuck City. We just gonna keep them in my house. I'm from Bronx River. I'm sorry. I used to be scared of you. It ain't happening no more. I'm leaving with my records. And Sundance punked out on me that day because he, he stepped aside because he was scared of Mario. But me and Mario started tussling. Fight. Fight me. Let me explain something to you about Mario Far that karate stuff. Mario was good putting fear in you. Mario could fight. Mario could fight, but now Jazzy J could fight too. Fight. I, I got in a couple of good looks to Mario too. He knew he was in a fight. We throwing each other around the room. But I wasn't backing down. Every place he go, he would snake. Long story short, he whipped my ass. Friendship. I able to leave out there with my bruises, licking my wounds. I left out there with all my records, except for one record, Kraftwerk. We are the robots. That was the record that was on the turntable. 
When Mario told me I wasn't down with Chuck City no more, I'm glad we had that fight. But even after that, we will still remain friends. He had a greater respect for me, and I had a greater respect for him. General Patton once said, battle is the most magnificent competition in which a human being can indulge. It's hard to conceptualize how a hip-hop battle can take place without dueling MCs. Now try to figure out how a hip-hop battle can happen without hip-hop. Back in the day, I bring my equipment out, you bring your equipment out, I set up on one side of a basketball court, you set up on the other side of a basketball court, and, and we just play music. You know, one DJ goes, he plays for a period of time, and then he shuts his system off, the next DJ turns his on. You play for half an hour, I play for half an hour. Once the crowd gets there, we just start turning each other's equipment up and see who, and see who keeps the crowd. Or we both turn the knobs and whoever got the loudest system wins. It might get to the point where I'm playing music and you just might turn your equipment up on me. And I'm like, you might get arrogant and just turn this shit up and drown the other dude out. You know, and he got to pack his shit up and bounce because he got embarrassed. Both DJ sound systems was banging and the DJs knew what to play. The crowd would just run back and forth. You, you go against the wrong DJs on the wrong day, they'll bring that equipment out and they just keep bringing speakers out, speakers out, piling them up. And you sitting there like, damn, how many speakers he gonna bring? How many power amps he got? You know what I mean? When the 80s came, so did one of the most devastating epidemics in recent memory. Crack swept the nation. Families were shattered. Countless lives were lost or destroyed. The lucky ones found a way through, but for many, fate would choose a more difficult path. The disco king had fallen from the kingdom that he had once ruled, having battled his addiction for over a decade. He overcame many challenges, but this time his demons refused to let go. Mario passed away in 1994. Sadly, the memory of him has also been taken, and the captor is still refusing to let go. Mario was my man. He made me, if, if the world liked the Chief Rocker, Disco King Mario brought me into the game. It's not on me. The DJs got their same shine, Flash. Like Grandmaster Flash still play today. Still be talked about in interviews. I never heard him mention Mario. Africa Bambata still do his thing. Sometime I might hear him mention Mario every now and then, but it ain't like he's supposed to. Cool Hurt was a friend to Mario. He talked to Mario all the time, I watched him. I was a young guy, I was a kid. They was grown men. When they do their documentaries and films and stuff, not to just even say, you know, my man Mario. He was the disco king Mario. We didn't have hip hop. So if it was just disco, then he was the king. Hip hop has always been a culture. Hip hop always came from culture. The art form, the culture of hip hop was not founded by one person. This art form and this culture was founded by a collective group of people. And I don't believe that just three people should get credit for being the fathers of hip hop. They've changed the game, they've evolved the game, but invent, I don't think so. It's just hurting to see all of this crap that they're saying on the internet and on Facebook and to see a lot of my friends talking, and they said they never mentioned Mario. I said, if it wasn't for Mario, this Whitney took off so fast. Well, Mario basically had been whited out of hip hop history because he died young. You know, people that know Mario, they old heads like me, but people in their 40s, they missed out. You know what I'm saying? People in their 30s, they don't know nothing about Mario. And I just wish that, uh, more people would tell their stories and their experiences with Mario because I would love to hear them. 
You know what I mean? I would actually treasure that. I just hope that people would, would um, have a little bit more integrity in, in, in telling our history so that the people that, that's not getting their props can get their props. If he'd, if he'd stuck around a little bit longer, he'd have been a king and a force to deal with. <laughs>